Hello everyone, welcome to Unlocking Daniel. Uh, this week we are excited to be jumping back into Daniel chapter 8. This is actually our second look um, uh, in Daniel chapter 8. And we're going to continue studying the 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary. Uh, but we actually won't be spending very much time in Daniel 8 today. Uh, but we're going to be looking a lot at Leviticus and some other places to really just try to understand what this cleansing of the sanctuary, this day of atonement is. Um, and we'll have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I was telling Renee that um, this is one of those topics that's a little challenging to present because there's some really cool application, but you kind of have to go through the understanding part to get to the application. And uh, there's quite a bit to really just kind of lay a framework for the biblical view of atonement and the Day of Atonement and cleansing. So we're going to move fast, we'll fly high, and we'll leave out lots of good juicy things that we could talk about. But we'll, we'll try to avoid the temptations and not talk about them all. So welcome, welcome, and uh, I'm going to ask if uh, Renee will have a word of prayer for us here as we begin. Dear God in heaven, Thank you for bringing us here tonight. There's no storms, as Reed said, and so we pray that you will keep the lines open of communication. We are going to be talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary and what happens with our sins. It makes me think of that text, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful promise. And so we hope that that promise becomes more clear by the end of this hour. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer and send the Holy Spirit to be in our minds and hearts as we go through this time together. In thy precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, again, welcome to everyone. And uh, we, just to start out with, as we are continuing to look at Daniel 8 and the Day of Atonement, I just want to very briefly remind us the ground that we've covered, um, which has been a lot. So in our last study, we looked at um, Daniel 8, 14, which says, Unto 2,300 days, or evenings and mornings, uh, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And this is a very enigmatic uh, time period. And there in Daniel chapter 8, it's associated with the time of the end. Um, and so this mm. prophecy is pointing toward the time of the end or the last days of Earth's history. And in our last study, we went and saw the connection between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 and saw how this 2300-day prophecy pointed uh, each day representing a year in history pointed from 457 BC up until the middle of the 19th century till 1844. Um, and we saw how that was a, a changing point in world history, the middle of the 19th century. But we want to understand a little more specifically what does that mean from a spiritual perspective um, and how um, are we to take this idea of the cleansing of the sanctuary uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back uh, and look at Leviticus and that Day of Atonement, the Feast of the Day of Atonement, and try to understand what's going on there and pull all these threads together. We, <laughs> I can't even count how many threads we're going to try to pull together. We're going to weave a tapestry, but you know, you've got to make all the threads going horizontal before you can start the vertical ones. So we're going to kind of lay out a lot of threads, and you might not see the connections between them immediately, but I think if you hang tight, uh, some of the connections will start to materialize. So with that said, let me just very quickly um, remind us that last time we looked at the prophetic nature of the seven feasts of Israel. So God gave the Israelites seven feasts uh, that they were to keep. And these feasts uh, we saw were not just commemorative looking back, but they were also prophetic looking forward. So, for instance, Christ, of course, was killed on the Feast of Passover, and the Bible makes very clear that He's our Passover lamb. Um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which represented cleansing, um, Christ uh, fulfilled, fulfilled that 
following immediately after Passover, that's when, of course, cleansing uh, is, is provided. He was the firstborn from the dead um, uh, and was raised on the, the Feast of First Fruits, the Yom Habikarim. Uh, we saw how Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, was poured out on the Feast of Pentecost, which is a Feast of Harvest. And then these last three feasts uh, were feasts that happened in the seventh month. Um, so there's a gap. Uh, you have three feasts in the first month, uh, 49 days um, until the Feast of Shavuot uh, or Pentecost. And then you have these um, last three feasts that happen in the seventh month. And by the way, if you're thinking biblically, you can kind of see the, the biblical pattern, right? Seven represents completion. The world, you know, creation begins on day one, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's completed with the, the rest of the Sabbath on the seventh day. And so we can kind of see that same sort of paradigm or framework with these seven feasts, in, you know, in the first month and the seventh month. Um, but something else I just want you to notice is that we also have a pattern of kind of six and then a series of six, and then a seventh that represents rest. That Feast of Tabernacles commemorated when they were brought to the Promised Land. God had told them, I will bring you to a place of rest in the Promised Land uh, there in Canaan. But we also know that in Revelation, the final rest, when God recreates, there's a new heaven and a new earth, and, you know, uh, sin is done away with and, 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 and gone, that is pointed to by the Feast of Tabernacles. In Revelation 21, it says, you know, God Himself uh, shall be with them. He shall tabernacle with them. Mm -hmm. It very specifically uses that word. And so that tabernacle is representing that final rest, um, the, the, uh, our eternity with Christ uh, in the new earth. So here's what's so interesting about this. You have a series of six, and then a seventh representing rest, mm -hmm. which means that the sixth is the day that is the preparation for the seventh, right? So the Jews, um, uh, uh, in Daniel's time, they were very aware that they would keep the Sabbath, the seventh day, and then the day before the Sabbath, you know, Friday, would be called the preparation day. And that day was the day that the work was completed in order for rest to take place on the Sabbath. Um, so we have this same sort of pattern here with the Feast of Israel. We'll see that the atonement that happens in the sixth is a way of putting sin um, uh, putting sin to rest, <laughs> you know, getting sin out of the way so that there can be this seventh um, feast, uh, this, this eternal feast. So the sixth is very important, um, and it's really representing the last days of earth's history in this final judgment period we'll see that prepares for eternity. And for the Jews and for Sabbath keepers, they, on the sixth day, we're cleaning the house, mm -hmm. we're preparing the food, just like mm -hmm. the Day of Atonement, everything is... Yeah, everything it's getting ready. Getting ready for that rest. Yeah, it's a time uh, of preparation. It's a time of kind of wrapping up mm -hmm. um, and getting ready for that seventh. And we'll see that the Day of Atonement uh, fits that, uh, that framework very well. So I, I want us to, as we continue here, um, to understand just a little bit of the importance of the Day of Atonement from the biblical uh, mindset. Many times when people think of the Feasts of Israel, Passover is probably the one they think of the most, mm -hmm. maybe Pentecost or something like that. And uh, those are important feasts. But um, if you were to ask a Jew today, even, what is the holiest day of the year? What is the most important feast? they would tell you it's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Um, and there is a biblical basis for that, and that's what I want to kind of show, with, uh, show you next. Um, it, we're going to spend a lot of time today looking at Leviticus 16. Uh, this is the chapter of the Bible that deals, the whole chapter that's given to the Day of Atonement. And we can see from the structure of Leviticus 
the importance of Leviticus chapter 16. So remember, a, a lot of uh, biblical um, writing is laid out in the form of a chiasm. A chiasm is this sort of mirror pattern where the first mirrors the last, the second mirrors the second to last, and so forth. And we find this all over um, the Bible in very small ways. You know, there might be one or two verses that are written in a chiasm, but then there's also in much larger movements, uh, such as the entire book of Leviticus. And in a chiasm, it's that center place that is the most important. That is what is given uh, the most attention. And so if you look at the chiasm of the book of Leviticus, uh, which by the way, I should pause here before I even talk about the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is the third book of the Bible. It is the center book of the Torah. So the five, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There is, in the Torah, there is mirroring or paralleling, maybe not a complete chiasm, some people argue that there is, but Leviticus is at the center. Let me just give you an example. If you look at the end of Genesis, in the very end of Genesis you find Jacob blessing his 12 sons, right? That are going to go on to become the 12 tribes of Israel. He blesses them, and his blessings aren't always a blessing. Some of them are kind of prophetic and not quite a curse, but, you know, maybe not quite the, the, the type of blessing that they were all hoping for. And then, after he blesses them, he dies. So that's the very first book of the Torah. The last book of the Torah, which is Deuteronomy, at the very end of Deuteronomy, what do we find? Moses blessing the 12 tribes of Israel which are the, named after the 12 sons of Jacob. And he goes down through and he blesses every one of the tribes. But they're not just blessings, they're prophetic. Um, and there's even some things in there that maybe they wished wouldn't be in there. So he, in the same way that Jacob blesses them, he blesses them and then he dies. This is very intentional. Oh, we have a comment here from Lori that she's lost sound. Can everybody else hear us? Okay, so maybe, Lori, it might just be something on your end. Um, so this parallel between Genesis and Deuteronomy is very intentional. The author um, intentionally wrote them that way. So we can see the, the first, there's this parallel between the first book and the last book. Leviticus is the center of the Torah, and the entire book of Leviticus is laid out in a chiasm. So we have um, chapters 1 to 7 our laws related to the people in the sanctuary. That's at the very beginning. At the very end, chapters 23 to 27, are laws related to the people in the sanctuary. Chapters 8 to 10, laws related to the priesthood. Uh, chapters 21 to 22, laws related to the priesthood. 11 to 15, laws related to the individual. We see the parallel of that. 17 to 20, laws related to the individual. And what do we find in the very center? The Day of Atonement. This is the day this is the chapter that is given the uh, most emphasis in the entire book of Leviticus, and it is structured to actually be at the very center of the Torah, of the five books of Moses. So this um, is a literary clue that many people um, you know, aren't aware of, but it's showing the importance of the Day of Atonement. And so we want to pay attention. Uh, there's all these... Uh, signals on the side of the road as we're driving saying, hey, pay attention in this chapter, pay attention in this chapter. So we don't want to just drive past very quickly. We want to, to focus in and try to learn uh, what is being taught here in the Day of Atonement. Okay, so let me, um, let me pause here for just a second. Uh, let me give an opportunity for any questions or comments. Does that make sense as far as the structure of Leviticus and the placement of Day of Atonement in that structure um, showing its significance to the biblical authors. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Any questions or comments about that? All right. We're going to roll on then. They've got it. You guys have got it. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about the sanctuary 
and how the system of sacrifices uh, and the setup of the sanctuary also gives emphasis to what happened on the Day of Atonement. So in the sanctuary that they, in the Old Testament that God made, He told Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the purpose, the goal is to, for God's people to be able to dwell in the presence of God, for God to be able to dwell in the presence of His people. Remember, this hasn't happened um, since Eden, when uh, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening, but there was sin. They were cast out of the garden because of the sin, not allowed to eat from the, the tree of life. By the way, when they're cast out of the garden, there was a gate placed in, do you remember the direction in Eden where the gate was? The east. In the east, that's right. Flaming angels with flaming swords are guarding the gate in the east. Mm -hmm. When you go to the sanctuary, you will find that the entrance to the sanctuary is a gate in the east. east. Mm -hmm. So the sanctuary is literally designed as to be a return to the presence of God that was lost, that used to be there in the Garden of Eden, but uh, was lost because they were cast out of the gate, and now they're going to return. In fact, as you approach and go through the sanctuary, you are approaching closer and closer to God's presence. God's presence is in the sanctuary is in the most holy place. Um, that's the, the last compartment there inside the tabernacle, the building itself. He, the intensity of His presence resides above the mercy seat. Um, that's uh, called His Shekinah glory. Um, God's presence is everywhere, but this is a, a, the best way I can describe it, is an intensity of His presence that was found nowhere else on earth. That He is um, um, there in a very real sort of way. As you go into the sanctuary, you are getting closer and closer to God's presence. It is a movement toward God. And in fact, the sacrifices of the sanctuary, when you would bring an offering to the sanctuary, those offerings were called korban, and that word korban literally means that which brings near. That which brings near. So the sacrifices of the sanctuary are bringing you near to God. Of course, it is sin that has caused the separation between God and His people, so the sacrifices are dealing with sin, and they are removing the barrier between God and His people, which is sin. So let me just um, explain just a little bit more about the structure of the sanctuary and how that points toward the Day of Atonement. There's really three phases of ministry in the sanctuary we see um, the outer courtyard where the sacrifices were offered. So you'd go into the gates, you'd bring your sacrifice, you'd lay your hands upon the head of that sacrifice, you'd confess your sin. As you're laying your hands upon the head of that sacrifice, that act is signifying that you are transferring your sin, your guilt, Mm -hmm. to the sacrifice, but then also this sacrifice is going to take your place. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be your representative. When Moses was going to die and he wanted Joshua to take his place, God told him to, he places his hand upon the head of Joshua and Joshua is now his replacement. Same thing happens with the sacrifices in the sanctuary. So imagine, put yourself in the the the, the the sandals of an Israelite. Um, you put your hand upon the head of that lamb or that goat. Um, you confess your sin, and this goat is now going to take your place in your behalf. And by the way, the goat had to be without blemish. Um, um, that's, of course, representing the, of, uh, uh, referring to the physical characteristics of the the sacrifice, but. It had a spiritual implication. Moses was said to be without blemish, without blemish meaning he is of upright, a pure character. So an innocent sacrifice is, is offered in your behalf. You confess your sins. You kill the sacrifice. 
It's offered there on the burnt altar. Um, the priest then would bring that sacrifice either by its blood or by eating some of it into the holy place. And this is the second phase of the sanctuary. So you have the outer courtyard where the sacrifice is killed, and then you have the holy place where intercession is made. The priest takes some of that blood and sprinkles it on the altar of incense, which is before the veil. Behind the veil on the other side is the most holy place where God's presence is. So every day, the priest is bringing this blood, sprinkling it there in the sanctuary, and day by day, that blood is being put there, interceding on behalf of the Israelites. So the first phase is the outer courtyard, the second phase is the holy place, and then once a year on the Day of Atonement, then and only then the priest could enter into the final compartment of the sanctuary, the most holy place. So you have this movement, courtyard, holy place, and then once a year to the most holy place. And by the way, we talked a little bit about this when we talked in Daniel 8 about the daily and how, yeah, the tamid, um, tamid, the daily work of the priest um, with the offerings and the intercession. This takes place. And then that daily goes on every day, morning and evening. Um, but then on the Day of Atonement, there is an entrance into the most holy place, into the presence of God. Um, in the biblical mindset, atonement and full cleansing from sin has three stages, represented by the three stages of the sanctuary. You have sacrifice, that's in the courtyard, intercession, that's in the whole holy place, and then we'll see there's this act of cleansing judgment that takes place in the most holy place. Sacrifice, intercession, and judgment. This is a little bit different than the way that we, um, in our modern minds, often in our Western minds, tend to think about tend to think about atonement. We typically only focus on sacrifice. Um, what Christ has done, the sacrifice that he has made, and view that as um, uh, all that is necessary for atonement. But the biblical mindset is we need sacrifice, intercession, and cleansing judgment. And so we're going to talk about that third phase, that day of atonement, that cleansing judgment, um, and what, that, uh, what happened and what it was signifying and why it's really good news. Uh, so that's kind of the part that we're going to focus on. So we've been giving a bit of a bigger picture background. We're going to now start getting into some of the details of the Day of Atonement and what it signifies and what it means. So we're going to dive in to Leviticus 16. So I encourage you to, yes, the very heart of Leviticus. Leviticus 16, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna put a few verses on the screen that are gonna show us the end result of what is happening in Leviticus 16, and we're gonna use that to kind of. Um, uh, help us understand the chapter before we start looking at the details of what gets us to that end result. Okay. So, in Leviticus 16, verses 17 and 18, um, it gives us kind of the final outcome of what happened. So, Renee, if you'll read those verses for us. That he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord to make atonement for it. Okay, this is talking about the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement. So notice that he makes atonement for himself. He makes atonement for his household and for all the people of Israel. Okay, so far so good. He is atoned, uh, or atonement has been made for the people. 
But then notice the second part um, here. He not only makes atonement for the people, but he also makes atonement for the altar. He says he makes atonement for himself, for his household, for the assembly of Israel. But then he says he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord to make atonement for it. Now that is the altar of... Ah, this is interesting. Um, is it the altar of burnt offering or the altar of incense? I'm, I'm not going to answer that question. We're going to, I'm going to, as we go along, let's see if you can figure it out. All right. As we go along, let's see if you can figure it out. Okay. So he's going to make atonement for the altar, or you could say for the sanctuary, if it's a kind of a proxy for the whole. Um, now that's interesting. That's not how we typically think, right? We understand atonement being made for people, but why is atonement being made for the altar or for the sanctuary? All right, let's keep digging here a little bit. Notice Leviticus 16, 19. If you'll read that for us, Renee. Leviticus 16, 19 on page 109. And uh, then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. Okay, so here it's talking again about the altar. The priest is going to sprinkle some of the blood from the sacrifice that's offered on the Day of Atonement on the altar seven times. And notice it says that he cleanses the altar, that this act of sprinkling the blood cleanses the altar. And notice what does he cleanse it from? He cleanses it from the uncleanness of of the children of Israel. So this is on the Day of Atonement. This is on the Day of Atonement. And we know that when the priest comes in there or goes to where whatever altar it is, he's doing this every day and he is he's sprinkling blood on this altar? Mm, so in the daily, blood yeah. is sprinkled on the altar, yes. So when he goes in there on the Day of Atonement, there's blood on the altar. It's mm -hmm. not clean. Right. Okay. And then he's going to take blood and sprinkle it on the altar. And that blood is said to cleanse the altar. Okay, how does that work, Reed? Ah, that's a good question. So um, before we talk about how that works, I want to just highlight very quick, quickly what Leviticus 16, 19 says that he's cleansing it from. The altar is being cleansed from the uncleanness... That's kind of a, a awkward word. You could say the, um, the, the, the defilement of or even the sins of the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. So somehow the sins of God's people have defiled the altar. The sins of God's people have defiled the altar and it has to be cleansed. So we understand God's people needing to be cleansed, mm -hmm. and that happens on the Day of Atonement, but the altar, the sanctuary, is going to be cleansed. And of course, that's what Daniel 8, 14 talks about, isn't it? Yes. Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Okay, let me put one more verse up here, and then we're gonna, we'll backtrack to Renee's question about how this cleansing works. All right, read, read Leviticus 16.30 for us, Renee. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Mm. So, um, um, we notice here that not only is atonement made for God's people and atonement made for the altar, the altar is cleansed, and God's people are cleansed. So this is what I really want us to understand. The cleansing that happens on the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, is twofold. It's a cleansing of God's people, and it's a cleansing of the sanctuary. Another way to put that is that you could say the cleansing of the sanctuary of our hearts, 
and a cleansing of God's sanctuary. Um, so there is there's two aspects to the cleansing on the Day of Atonement, two aspects of atonement, God's people and the sanctuary itself. Now this is not very intuitive to us because we typically only think of cleansing in terms of humans being cleansed. But we've talked about how the sanctuary in the Old Testament represents the sanctuary in heaven. How could there be a need for cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven? Yes, how is that? Because we think of heaven as being perfect and clean and yeah. pristine. Right, so right. How, how does it need cleansing? Kind of this ivory tower. Yes. Uh, separated from the uncleanness and the sin of earth. But here we have a picture of the sanctuary itself needing to be cleansed because of the uncleanness or the defilement that has been brought into it. And that is the defilement of the Israelites that has been brought into the sanctuary. So to understand the symbolism and how this is working, we need to understand the symbolism of blood in the Old Testament. Um, we're going to see that blood in the sanctuary system represents two things. Um, and if we only think about it one way, it's going to be very hard for us to understand the Day of Atonement. To understand the Day of Atonement, we have to represent, understand the twofold symbolism of blood. Now, I've got a hand up here. Let me, let me grab this hand from Joe or Toya or Brandy or one of them. And I don't mean to interrupt your sure. quote, but, uh, mm. did this continue until the temple was destroyed? Mm -hmm. Yes, it did. Um, the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, continued all the way up through until the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Now, there were time periods where it lapsed and it didn't take place. For instance, in Ezekiel 8, just before, um, well, so the cleanse, the, of course, the temple was destroyed twice. So destroyed by the Babylonians and then again destroyed by the Romans. So in Ezekiel 8, um, we can see that probably the Day of Atonement wasn't happening, right? Because you've got idols there in the sanctuary itself. I don't think they're keeping the Day of Atonement if they're doing that. Um, so, but up until then, it, it had been going on on a regular basis. And certainly during the time of Christ, uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the Day of Atonement was taking place. Okay, good question. So we're going to look at the twofold symbolism of the blood in the sanctuary service. The blood in um, the Bible is representative of life. And because it is representative of life, it can represent two things. So here in Leviticus 17.11, which is just after uh, the chapter we're looking at in the Day of Atonement, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it, upon you, given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So this is a very important verse because... One, it lets us know that the sacrifices, from the biblical perspective, the life of the sacrifice that's being offered is considered to be a gift from God. This isn't a gift that they are offering to earn their salvation. God says, I have given you the life of that sacrifice, the blood that has been shed, to make atonement for you. So notice where it's coming from. It's not considered to be coming from the Israelites, although they're taking it from their flock. But the gift of that sacrifice on their behalf is considered to be from God. And God says, I'm giving the life, the blood, for you to make atonement. So the, 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 blood, the life is in the blood. We can't live without it. That blood represents the life. And that life is given in atonement for the sins of the Israelites. So in a similar way, in verse 14, we see, for it is, talking about the blood, for it is the life of all flesh, its blood sustains its life. So the blood represents the life that is shed for the Israelites as a gift from God to make atonement for them. 
And here's where it gets a little bit interesting. Um, if you notice that in the Bible, when you look at blood used as a symbol, you will see that it represents both guilt and cleansing. Now, we're not going to go through. These are just some examples of verses on the screen. Um, you, we could find many more. Uh, you might want to take a screen capture or something of this, and you can uh, check these verses out later. But if you were to look up all the verses on the left-hand side, you will see in all these verses, blood is used as a symbol of guilt. If you were to look at the verses on the right-hand side, you'll see that blood is used as a symbol of cleansing. So, think for a minute about uh, the very first verse there in Genesis, Genesis 4. Cain kills his brother Abel, mm -hmm. and God says to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood, crying out. yeah, crying out to me. Now, that's not literally taking place. It's, he's using uh, symbolic language, but he's saying that blood is symbolic of your guilt. That blood represents your guilt because you've taken an innocent life. Mm -hmm. He has shed innocent blood. He has taken an innocent life, and therefore that blood represents his guilt. We can think about many other examples. Um, when Pilate uh, doesn't want to be guilty of the death of Jesus, what does he say uh, to the priests and the Pharisees and those Jews who were responsible? He says, his blood be upon you, mm -hmm. meaning the guilt of his death be upon you. But we could also say that in the Bible, blood not only represents guilt, but it also represents cleansing. And we have many examples of this in Scripture. Let me just look with you at one example, Ezekiel 43, verse 20. And that's on page 849. 849. All right, Ezekiel 43. Verse 20, remember Ezekiel is a contemporary to Daniel. He is describing uh, a prophetic vision of the rebuilding of the temple. Um, and notice what he says in verse 20 of Ezekiel 43. You shall take some of the blood and put it on the four horns of the altar, on the four corners of the ledge, and on the rim around it. Thus you shall cleanse it and make atonement for it. Okay. So this is pointing toward a Day of Atonement that Ezekiel is prophesying. And notice what he says. The blood is providing cleansing for the altar. Um, we can find uh, language, of course, where um, the blood of Christ provides cleansing for God's people. Uh, there's many places where blood is used to symbolize cleansing. All right. Then that's what it symbolizes, the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. the animal. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, even in the modern world, we, we think of blood as life, don't we? When you go mm -hmm. to the doctor and he wants to know how much life you have in you, what does he do? Yeah. Or the technique. Checks your blood, yeah. Yeah, they draw some blood out and they look yeah. at it under a microscope. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can relate to that. Yeah, yeah, very much so. So here's how these two aspects of the blood come together. In the daily service, sacrifice is brought to the temple, lay your hands upon the sacrifice, you kill the sacrifice, and the blood of that sacrifice is brought and sprinkled before the altar of incense there in the holy place. The blood is sprinkled there on the altar before the holy place uh, as the priest makes intercession for you. When that blood is sprinkled there on the altar, it represents cleansing because the sinner is being cleansed and experiencing forgiveness, but it also represents guilt. Because what has the sinner had to do? They've had to confess their sin mm -hmm. upon the head of an innocent animal. That innocent animal had to die because of their sin. That blood is brought into the sanctuary, and that blood, yes, is a record of their cleansing, 
but is also a record of the sin that was committed to cause that innocent life to be shed. So the, the blood is representing both cleansing and guilt. Every day it's being sprinkled there before the altar of incense. And every day there is a record of cleansing, but it's also a record of guilt. Now, how does this work from a heavenly perspective? If the sanctuary in the Old Testament is representing the true tabernacle, the true sanctuary in heaven, how does this work? How can defilement or guilt be brought into heaven itself? Well, I want you just to think a little bit about the process of forgiveness. And this is kind of going back to your question, and you can let me know if we answer it all or not. Um, uh, 1 John 1, 9, you prayed uh, that verse in your prayer. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in order for cleansing to take place, confession has to be made. And confession is declaring your sin, right? This is something that we need to consider from heaven's perspective. The act of declaring sin, the declaration of sin, is in itself defiling. It's not just sin, but even the knowledge of sin that can cause defilement. And we know this on a, on a very practical, everyday basis. I'm sure that you are like me, that there have been times that you have watched the news, maybe read something uh, in the newspaper or on the internet about a sin or an atrocity that somebody has committed. Uh, you know, think about maybe some of the worst things that humans do to other human beings, you know, um, you know rape and genocide. And I, I, in fact, I just was with a family from Syria um, just yesterday, and the, uh, they were refugees who had to flee their home. And um, I think that the stories that they shared with me and the unimaginable um, brutality that they faced, it seems like those words are burned in my mind. Now, I didn't take part in that sin. I had nothing to do with it. And yet, the very act of hearing it has an effect upon me. Haven't you felt that way before watching the news or reading something? That you feel, you feel defiled by someone else's sin. The message of the sanctuary is that for sin to be cleansed, it has to be brought before God. It has to be laid out plain before Him. It has to be confessed before Him. In fact, the Bible records, you know, says that there are books that are being kept. Um, so just think about this. A perfect, holy being. I mean, his, his perfection and holiness are hard for us to comprehend. And yet, every day, for cleansing to happen, for forgiveness to happen, a declaration a record of sins has to be brought into his presence before him. I never really thought of it that way. Yeah. And there is a sense where our sins have even defiled heaven. Mm. Now, it's, it's willing on God's part. If God just wanted to wash himself of us and say, you know, your blood be upon you, he could, you know, just cut us loose and have nothing to do with us. But he is allowing this record of sins to be brought into his presence so that they can be forgiven. But even that record itself is defiling. Mm -hmm. On the Day of Atonement, the idea, as we'll see, is that the record is going to be wiped clean that there is no longer a record of the sin, that the sins are not only forgiven, but even the record of them is forgotten, mm. that the record is cleansed there in the sanctuary. 
So it's not just forgiven in my heart, but it's forgotten in heaven. The record is wiped clean in heaven. And that's good news. Yes. That's really good news. Yes, it is. But there's something that has to happen for all of that to take place. And that's the end goal of the Day of Atonement. This, this final purging, this final cleansing of sin, this record of sin being blotted out so that this cycle of sin doesn't keep going on endlessly and endlessly. But sin is put behind us. Even the record of it is cleansed. And there is a full, clean start. Um, and sin will, will be no more. So let's jump now to Leviticus 16. Go ahead. I, talking about the confession and the cleansing, um, I had a friend who is a counselor, mm -hmm. and we were talking in this case about a father who abused a child. Mm -hmm. And she said, that is the most difficult thing for me to deal with mm -hmm. as a counselor. Yes. And, and you naturally think that because of what happens. But the reason she said it's difficult is not because of the act. It's because often the perpetrator will not confess. Mm. He will not admit. Mm -hmm. And until he admits, until he confesses, mm -hmm. he cannot move to a place of cleansing. Mm -hmm. So that, that process is very, very important. Mm -hmm. We have to realize what we have done yeah. that hurts the heart of God as you mm -hmm. described before we can change right. and be renewed. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the Bible speaks um, against, you know, this human tendency to cover our sin. Yes. Right? Adam yes. and Eve, you know. Yes. But it's, uh, cleansing happens when it's laid bare. Yes. Exactly. And, you know, the, the gritty, ugly details, you know, the, the reality of our sin is brought there before God in all of its ugliness, yes. and then it's cleansed. Yes. Then it can be dealt with. Yes. Um, and that's not easy to do. No, that's not is. easy to do. No. Um, the human tendency is to want to withdraw and uh, you know, flee um, rather than bring our sin in the presence of God. But that's what's happening in the Day of Atonement. Sin is being brought into the presence of God and then expunged, cleansed uh, fully and finally. So, okay, let's jump in Ezekiel, I mean, uh, Leviticus 16 here. So, if you'll turn with me, uh, we were there a little bit earlier. It's page 109, depending on the verse you're choosing. Yep, uh, so if you're using the Bibles that we provided, um, we are on page, actually we're going to be on 108. Um, we'll read the first two verses here to give us a little bit of the narrative context of what's going on. And we're reading verses 1 and 2? Yeah, 1 and 2, if you'll read those for us. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of two, the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Hmm. So Aaron, his sons, Nadab and Abihu, had brought this profane fire before God. Um, they had done what was right in their own eyes rather than following the instruction of God. And um, not only was this um, a sin against God, but they are to be representatives to the people. And so there's a judgment that takes place. Um, they are killed. And Aaron is being told, Aaron, you, you have to do not what is right in your eyes, but the way that God has instructed you. And God can only be approached in the most holy place, not any time, but just this one time of year on the Day of Atonement. Um, and that's where it says he will um, appear in the cloud that's above the mercy seat. So this is him coming into the presence of God. Um, and uh, maybe I should just say this very quickly. Um, uh, the, the biblical view of God's presence is not that God is so mean and terrible that when we come before him, you know, he kills us. Um, 
but it's it's more that he is so other than us. Yeah. He is so powerful. Mm -hmm. He is so holy mm -hmm. um, that we can't just kind of lackadaisically just you know go in however we want. He's good, um, but his goodness and his presence is so intense that we need to um, approach him on his terms and not our own. Consuming fire. Yeah. You can't just go up and touch. Yeah. A consuming fire. You think about that fire in the fireplace. It's good. It brings warmth. Yes. Um, but you don't want to just reach your hand in there. Right. Um, and its very nature is what, you know, uh, uh, being hot is what provides that warmth, but it also means that it is um, dangerous in a sense. Yes. If approached in the wrong way. There's physiological components to mm -hmm. the fire of God, and He wants to protect us, but He wants to be near us yeah. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, uh, all of this also is um, wrapped up with the idea that we are sinners approaching the presence of a holy God. Yes. And so uh, Leviticus 16 is how, we, um, how God's presence is approached on the Day of Atonement there in the Most Holy Place. Okay, let me, uh, I see Lori has got a hand up for a question or a comment. Lori, uh, please, what's your question or comment? So many ministries that are trying to downplay the requirement of confession, hmm. one, and also that God has any kind of requirements in, of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, they're just trying to make God seem, I don't know, like a lovable stuffed animal that has nothing, <laughs> you know, no, no requirements at all. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely seems to be one of the uh, stumbling blocks that have been thrown out there in this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Laura's comments about those who seem to minimize the, the biblical view of God having requirements and ways that He is to be approached. Um, and really, we as humans, we tend to get in trouble when we minimize one aspect of God versus another. In the Bible, God is portrayed as just and merciful. Um, and if we think of Him just as just and not as merciful, we have a very distorted picture. If we think of him just as merciful, but not just, if he's only merciful, but not just, it distorts our picture. But when he is just and merciful, um, that is when we get a, a complete picture of who he is. Um, and we see both of those in the sanctuary, right? Um, what, what, where is the cloud that meets the, the, that's the cloud of his presence? It's above the mercy seat. Yes. Um, and here, these ideas of God's justice there is a righteous requirement, but there's also a merciful provision. They come together beautifully on the Day of Atonement. And even though, Reed, even though it was over the mercy seat, they could see it outside in the camp. Couldn't they see the light at night, the fire? Uh, so um, I think you're thinking of the, the, the cloud, the pillar of cloud During that uh, was above the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, and presence. day, mm -hmm, and the fire by night mm -hmm. um, as they were traveling through the wilderness. And I think that was a outward visualization to them yes. of God's presence there in the uh, most holy place, yes. his, his Shekinah presence. Okay, so what happens on this Day of Atonement? Uh, we're not going to go through all the instruction, but um, so th the rest of this chapter is God through Moses instructing Aaron the high priest how he is to approach God, what he is to do on this one day of the year um, when he enters in the most holy place, this day of atonement. So the first part is he offers this sacrifice of cleansing for himself and his uh, family, this bull that is offered. By the way, when he goes into the most holy place, he doesn't go with all of his priestly garb. He goes in a very simple, plain linen robe. The high um, priest. The high priest. The high priest garb. Yeah, which is, is very interesting because... Um, it's kind of a coming into God's presence with humility in a sense. Um, when he is before the people, when he is representing God to the people, he's dressed like a king, like a god. You know, these jewels, this gold, you know. But when he is representing the people before God, 
He's dressed very simply and very humbly. Jesus, the man. Yeah, Jesus, yeah. Jesus, the man, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the two for the, the, he's got a hand upon both divinity and humanity. Um, so then a lot is cast um, between two goats. There are two goats. A lot is cast. And um, so this is a, a random way. Um, it's kind of symbolizing God choosing rather than men. Lot is cast. And it says one of the lots falls uh, the, uh, upon a goat, and that goat is said to be for the Lord. The other goat is the the lot that falls for the other goat is said to be for um, Azazel um, or Azazel. Uh-huh. Um, I wish we had a, a lot of time to go into this. Um, this is a very disputed. Some translations just translate it as scapegoat. That's what New King James translates it here. Um, there. My take on it, um, and I'm going to throw it out there without a lot of support, and um, <laughs> you can get mad at me and um, argue and whatever, but we won't, we won't have the time to go into all this. Um, the, the, there are, it, it seems like there's two uh, opposing forces. One goat is, uh, is for the Lord, and one goat is for um, uh, Azazel. And I think that is the, a, a being who is the opposite or the counterpart mm-hmm. of God. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, goat, the scapegoat or the one that is Azazel, is eventually cast out into the wilderness. Yes. It's banished into the wilderness. It's not offered as a sacrifice for sins, but it's cast out into the wilderness. Mm-hmm. And the way I view this, and... Again, this is, this is my perspective, you could disagree and that's fine, is that that is representative of what happens in Revelation 20 yes. when Satan himself is bound into this bottomless pit. Um, he is unable to, he is confined, he's chained, he's unable to attempt uh, for this period of a thousand years. And then he's destroyed um, and with him sin uh, is is destroyed, death is destroyed, you know, hell is destroyed, and it's done with. Um, it's a way that sin is is cast out, is is removed forever. Mm-hmm. That's my view. Well, um, and we unfortunately we don't have a lot of time to go into the the two goats, but because we're going to focus mostly on the one goat that is said to be for the Lord, and what happens with that sacrifice. I've got a hand up from Brenda, and I'm very tempted to not take it because she's probably going to ask about these two goats. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to, I don't want to follow that rabbit tra- trail. But Brenda, what's your question or comment? It was just a comment. The scapegoat or Azazel, whatever you want to call it, was not sacrificed. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, he's not. Um, that, that can't in any way cleanse any of our sins. Mm-hmm. That's a good, very good point. Yeah. Um, and again, you may disagree, um, and that's fine. But my view is that it's a counterpart and it's ultimately showing that um, those who are responsible for sin will bear their sin, will bear the punishment for uh, their sin, and sin will be removed from God's people forever. I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> That's at least one in my corner. We'll see. Maybe there's more. Um, so what happens to the goat that the law is cast um, for this goat, and it's said to be for the Lord? So that goat is killed. And then its blood is brought into the holy place and then the most holy place. So we're going we're gonna to read that together. Um, we're going to read verses 15 all the way down through 19. Um, so we're in Leviticus 16. We're looking at verses 15 down through 19. If you'll read those for us, Renee. Then you shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull. And sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out. And he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. 
and he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull, some of the blood of the goat, and put it on the horns of the altar all around. That's the altar of incense, right? And then he <laughs> shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. Okay, so the blood is brought in. It is sprinkled there on the mercy seat. Okay. So it's, it's brought behind the veil. On the Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant. It's sprinkled there. Um, he is said to also make atonement in the holy place. The holy place. Um, so this would be uh, where the Ark of Incense is. The altar, the altar of incense is. And then, it's interesting, it says he goes out. Yes, then he goes out. So I think that the altar that is being referred to when he goes out is the altar of burnt offering. Oh, okay, because I thought when it says the altar that is before the Lord. Yeah, so um, it all, I think, is in a sense before the Lord. Okay. Um, it. Anyway, it could be interpreted that way, but to, I think because it says he goes out, that he's offering it. So he, if you think about the stages, it's kind yes. of reverse. Um, uh, most holy place, mercy seat, then he makes atonement for the holy place, and then, and he, then goes he goes out. I hear you. Okay. And, and that curtain is, is open between the holy and the most mm -hmm. holy place mm -hmm. on the Day of Atonement. Yes. Um, so... In verse 20, he kind of gives this um, uh, summary. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring, and then he goes on to bring the live goat. So he's, 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 the whole thing is being cleansed, yes. um, you know, top to bottom. Uh, it's this, uh, it's not a spring cleaning, it's a fall cleaning, I guess. But um, the, the, the sanctuary is being cleansed. So let me just kind of go back to our... Um, symbolism of the blood. So every day the blood is being brought, the blood is being brought. That symbolizes cleansing for the individual, but it also is guilt that is being brought before God, confession of sin. On the day of atonement, that blood is cleansed with blood, right? Mm -hmm. Brought, and we're talking symbolically here, yeah, right? As in the blood that's brought in every day mm -hmm. is cleansed by the blood on the Day, day of, of atonement. atonement, yes. Okay. On that goat that is said to be for the Lord, sins were not confessed on the head of that goat. Um, uh, so it is, in a sense, fully innocent. The blood that is being brought is fully innocent. And the sanctuary is being cleansed of the record of sins mm -hmm. with the blood that is brought in on the Day of Atonement. And so this, in the mind of the Israelite, meant that each day that I bring a sacrifice to the sanctuary, my sin is transferred, in a sense, to that sacrifice. It's brought there before God and put in His presence um, each day. But on the Day of Atonement, that sin that is brought in there before God is cleansed forever, and it's gone. Um, so the record of that sin is blotted out. And that sin is not only no longer on me, but it's no longer in the presence of God. And it's forgotten. It's gone. And that, for them, was, um, it, it says that atonement is made for them. They are fully cleansed. That, I mean, you can think about the idea of, um, you know, even the record, the memory of your sin being wiped away. That's something to celebrate. It's I mean, is. something to it be just is. exuberant about. Mm -hmm. And it was this, the whole sins of that year are forgotten. They're thrown into the sea. And now the new year is beginning and I, there's a perfectly clean slate. And it's not even a file kept on me somewhere that I, I don't have to worry, you know, about somebody opening it up and seeing. It's gone. The record is blotted out. And the cleansing is perfect and complete. That reminds me of a story that Ivor Myers tells. Okay, yes. Yeah, Ivor Myers, and it, for the first time it really made sense to me when he told this story where um, we clean the house, ladies we know, you men too, 
we clean the house and we take the trash out to the backyard. There's a big receptacle here in Newmarket. We take it to our backyard, put in our trash from mm -hmm. the week. And it sits out there all week till Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We take it out and it sits there. We see it. We know it's there. Ah, but one day a week. This big, huge trash truck comes mm -hmm. and takes all that trash away, and we never see it again. It's gone. And that's the Day of Atonement. And we don't even think about it again. No. I'm going to think, how much trash have I thrown away in my life? And I don't even, I mean, it's, it's, once it's gone, it's yeah. gone out of my mind. Yes, it's gone, mm -hmm. and um, it's wonderful. And then everything is really clean. Yeah. I really like that illustration. Um, uh, I'm going to modify it just a little bit. Okay. So what if when you brought the trash out of your house, you put it on your neighbor's lawn? Oh, Reed. <laughs> We're going to have trouble. <laughs> um, now, you feel good that it's out of your house, but yeah. there it's in your neighbor's lawn, right? Yeah. Oh, man. You don't really want it to be there. Yeah. So you're really happy when the trash cup, truck comes and, and removes it. That's kind of the sense of the, the sanctuary. It's I've taken my sin, and I'm glad they're off of me, but they're there in God's presence. Mm. And, oh, what a relief when they are yes. wiped away and cleansed, yes. even from me and from the sanctuary, yes. and they're gone for good. So. Yes. Yeah, I like that illustration. Thank you. Okay, we got a hand up, a question or a comment from Joe or one of her crew there. So if um, for the... Israelites mm -hmm. happens once a year. Mm -hmm. How does that correspond to what's happened in heaven? So, like, it's once a year the books cleanse for them? Ah, uh, very good question. You want to repeat? Um, yeah. So, Joe's question is for the Israelites, this happened once a year with a yearly feast. Um, and how does that correspond to what's happening in heaven? Um, this just take place once a year. This is kind of, you know, heaven kind of doing an audit of its books once a year or something. How does this happen? Well, um, we're going to get into this, but remember kind of the, the prophetic nature of the feasts, um, even though Passover pointed toward Christ, you know, it happened every year, but it pointed to Christ's death. It happened once in kind of the scope of cosmic history. Um, and I think what Daniel is saying is that this cleansing of the sanctuary is going to be something that happens at the end of Earth's history um, before we are reaching this period of final rest uh, where we are with God and sin is fully behind us. Um, so it's pointing toward a, a larger cosmic event that's not happening on a yearly basis, but happens once on a, 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 a cosmic sort of basis, if that makes sense. God is a really good teacher, you know, the remedial... Um, sanctuary, and he has us act out things. Mm -hmm. So we, we really get it in our heads. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't as much as the Israelites did now. Mm -hmm. But he's acting. We're acting out what's going to happen, as you said, yeah. prophetically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's that's a good transition, maybe to the next verses I want to read together in Leviticus 16 on what this meant for the individual Israelites as they're acting this out, as they're going through this. And um, that, uh, that mindset will help us to understand a little more of the, the, what the day means in the context of Daniel. So we're going to look at Leviticus 16. Um, let's read 29. Oh... Well, let's just read all the way through 34, just, just to kind of get the, the full scope here. Okay, this shall be a statute forever for you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native or your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statue forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments, 
Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting, and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priest, and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you, to make atonement for the children of Israel, for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay. So again, atonement is being made for God's people, but also for the sanctuary. And notice what they are supposed to do. They're not to work, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a day of, of rest, uh, but it's called a day of solemn rest. So it's not um, joyous in the, 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 the sense of maybe some of the other feasts, but they are to afflict their souls. Uh, they are to, you know, be searching their hearts, confessing their sin, repenting of their sin. In a sense, I think what they are doing is they are making sure that their trash has gotten out of the house <laughs> and to the curb yes. because the garbage truck is on its way, yes. right? And I mean, I don't know if you ever did this. I remember as a kid, um, it would often be my chore to take out the trash, but I would forget the night before. Oh. And when it would come at like six o'clock in the morning, yes. I would hear it coming down the street. <laughs> and how quickly I would have to run out and get the trash and put it out on the curb. Um, and I think that's kind of, that urgency is kind of what's happening on the yes. Day of Atonement. Make sure that your sins are in the presence of God so that they be, can be cleansed and forgiven. Uh, because the trash truck is coming and you don't, you don't want to miss it. Right. Um, it. Kind of along this lines, let's go to one other place in Leviticus where it talks about what the Israelites were supposed to do on the Day of Atonement. So if you go over to chapter 23 of Levit Leviticus, chapter 23 is the chapter that talks about all of the feasts. Um, it goes through the list from Passover all the way to the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's a section here, of course, that talks about the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And I just want to read this together. Um, and I want you to see um, the language here of how they are to act on the Day of Atonement and what the consequence of not doing that is. So if you'll read that for us, Renee. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, also, the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in his soul on the same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does not do any work, who does any work, on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall be, do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month. At evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Okay. So... This is actually a very stark warning compared to how the other feasts are described. In none of the other feasts is there um, uh, a declaration of negative consequences if you don't keep it, you know. Um, but here it says, if you do work, if you don't abstain from all work, if, you know, if you're not afflicting your soul, you're going to be cut off or mm -hmm. destroyed from amongst God's people. So there's this, this kind of judgment language. Yes. Um, and the Sabbath was actually a different sort of Sabbath because they weren't even supposed to do um, some of the basics that may have taken place on a regular weekly Sabbath. They were to do no work at all. Um, so, you know, they're not um, preparing, you know, food. And, I mean, there's just no work that is being done. Um, they're keeping it um, in a very um, strict, I guess you might say. But the, the idea is they're very focused mm -hmm. on what is going on in, they can't see it in their, with their eyes, but their hearts are supposed to be kind of fixed on what the high priest is doing there in the most holy place and making sure that their sin is there before God. Um, and if they don't do that, it's said that they are to be um, cut off or, you know, there's this language of judgment. So because of this, even uh, Jews today who often maybe who are otherwise secular, 
many of them who may not keep any of the other feasts will um, in some manner keep the Day of Atonement, keep Yom Kippur, uh, because it's, it's the holiness of this day um, is considered to be much greater. Uh, it's a much more solemn obligation than any of the other feasts. I want to, um, along those same lines, I want to um, read for you some quotes, uh, read together some quotes that show how in the Jewish mindset, the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, is connected with this idea of judgment. Because uh, we can see here this judgment language, those who don't um, uh, afflict their souls are going to be cut off. And there's kind of this seen this as this dividing. If, um, if you are right with God, if your sins are brought in the sanctuary, then your sins are cleansed and you start that next year on with a clean slate, but if you don't, your sins will be held, um, uh, you, you will be accountable for your sins, and the guilt of those sins will be placed upon you uh, because you did not trust God and you did not bring them before God in the sanctuary. So there's this sense of judgment, um, uh, those who are cleansed and those who are not. And I would just want to read for you some, uh, read together some quotes um, uh, from uh, showing the kind of the Jewish perspective on this day. So this is from um, a uh, Jewish prayer book for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah is the Feast of Trumpets, which is leading up. It's announcing, you know, for these 10 days that Yom Kippur is coming. And so there's a prayer book. Um, and notice, notice the language that is used here. We must give all holiness to this day, for it is a day of fear and trembling. On this day your reign shall be established and your throne affirmed, for you are the judge, the prosecutor, and the witness, he who writes and seals. And you will remember the things long forgotten, and open the book of memory, and then shall the great shofar and the voice of silence shall be heard. The angels shall be gripped by fear and trembling, and shall say, Behold the day of judgment. Okay, so notice the language here. It's talking about God. God, on this day your throne is established, um, and it's made firm. Um, this is a day when you are looking at the books and the, 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 the memory of them. Um, and, it, you know, it's called a day of judgment. So again, that record is being examined and expunged or held to people's account. Um, and, you know, sin is being blotted out or people are, are going to bear the responsibility for it. And they were working up to that for 10 days. Mm -hmm. you said Through that, Rosh Hashanah, the, yeah. the Feast of Trumpets, so, yes. So, yeah, so the big day of the test. Now, notice this quote from, uh, this is the Jewish Encyclopedia, a very standard uh, reference volume for um, uh, uh, Jews, and uh, this is from the 1906 edition, and notice on the entry of the Day of Atonement what it says. God seated on his throne to judge the world, at the same time judge, pleader, expert, and witness, openeth the book of records, it is read, every man's signature being found therein. The great trumpet is sounded, a still small voice is heard. The angels shudder, saying, this is the Day of At Judgment. On New Year's Day, the decree is written. On the Day of Atonement, it is sealed. Who shall live and who are to die, etc. But penitence, prayer, and charity may avert the evil decree. I'm hearing words of revelation. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of words of revelation there. In fact, of course, revelation is really going to pick up on many of the themes of the the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, this final cleansing of sin, this final uh, judgment so that um, sin can be done away with and there can be this reign of righteousness, this, the final Feast of Tabernacles. Yes, so the, the happy part. Comes. Yeah, the happy part. So we've <laughs> got to get this, this ugly stuff you know, cleansed and get the, the, the garbage out so get that we can clean. Yeah, get the house clean so that we can have the happy part. So notice, again, the language, um, the books, judgment, um, and there's this uh, examination whether the, uh, the, you're going to be found, um, uh, you know, life and death really is what yes. it says, you know, life and death. Uh, life and death. 
Um, so with, with all of this, I want us to kind of consider um, what these things mean from a spiritual perspective. So we, we kind of looked at what happened in the, the Old Testament and the Day of Atonement, but let's zoom out now and look at a, at a bigger perspective. You know, what is this cleansing of the sanctuary? Uh, what is this prophecy that points to the cleansing of the sanctuary? What is um, that looking like from a, a larger perspective? Um, the Bible is clear that heaven itself needs cleansing from human sin that took place on earth. And we've talked about this. We, we saw the symbolism of that there in the sanctuary. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 and 20, uh, through 28. So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. That's 1153. Hebrews 9, 22 through 28. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who, are e who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Okay, beautiful verse here. Yes. So notice... Just, just notice the basic framework here in Hebrews 9. Heaven has to be purified by the blood of Christ. And he's going to do this. It says at the end of the age, heaven will be purified and sin will be put away. Amen. Will be finally, fully put away. Now, that's just amazing to think about. Um, so, again... Our sin that is confessed is brought before God. And that act, even though it's an act of cleansing for us, there's a sense of defilement as that record, that confession of sin is brought before God. And here in Hebrews it's saying that, that heaven itself is cleansed through the blood of Christ and that record of sins at the end of the ages is done away with mm -hmm. so that sin can be fully and finally put away. I believe that the prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then this shall the sanctuary be cleansed, is pointing forward to that time mm -hmm. when earth's history is wrapping up, mm -hmm. when the, the, the sins that are there in heaven are being cleansed and purged. Christ is going to come back. Mm -hmm. There is judgment. Mm -hmm. Sin will be put away fully and finally. Revelation 20 records, you know, Satan um, uh, being uh, cast into the abusos. I, I think of it like the wilderness. And then, after all that, there is this peace, this Feast of Tabernacles, this eternity with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I believe what is being depicted in Daniel is this final judgment, this final phase of earth's history when um, things are coming to an end, the, the, the records of heaven, are uh, the sins that are there are going to be wiped clean, blotted out forever. Christ is going to come back and give to each, um, you know, uh, some to life, some to, to the, 
uh, the sin, the consequences of the sin that they have chosen, the wages of sin is death, and then sin will be put away and done with. Hallelujah. Amen. Looking it's good news. It is real good news. And it's a story that we've talked about before in the book of Daniel, that final phase where God sets all things right. In fact, we've actually already talked about judgment in the book of Daniel. In chapter 7 and very quickly I'm like running out of time here but I want to tie a few threads here together and I want you to see how this cleansing of the sanctuary ties in with the larger picture of the book of Daniel so if you notice with me we've looked before at the parallels between Daniel 2 Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 we have these series of kingdoms uh, in Daniel 7 and 8, we have a series of kingdoms. We have a little horn. And then notice what happens right after Daniel, the little horn in Daniel 7 and right after the little horn in Daniel 8. In Daniel 7, we have a little horn. And then the court is seated. And there's judgment. And dominion is taken away. In Daniel 8, we have a little horn. And then right after that, the sanctuary is cleansed. And the horn is broken without hands. In Daniel 7, the court being seated, it parallels the sanctuary being cleansed in Daniel 8. The record being wiped clean. Um, uh, for those who have trusted in God, for those who have put their sins in the sanctuary, but then there are those who the record isn't wiped clean for, and uh, the consequences of sin will be upon them. Um, go with me very quickly to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to wrap this all up, hopefully. That's 864 in your Bible, page 864, Daniel 7, 9 through 10. As we're looking at Daniel 7, think about the imagery of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus, and also think about the language of the Day of Atonement that we just read that the Jews use, about the books being opened, yes. about it being a day of judgment, a day of decision. Um, okay, so we're going to read Daniel 7. Uh, let's start in verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame. Its wheels of burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Okay, so this is a judgment scene. Mm -hmm. You've got, by the way, it says thrones are put in place. That's not singular, it's plural. Thrones are put in place. You've got uh, the Ancient of Days. Uh, he is uh, glorious and um, intense. This is the throne room of God. This is the most holy place, right? Of the heavenly sanctuary. And then notice what's there. The, the angelic host um, is there. The court is seated and books are opened. Judgment is taking place. Judgment is taking place. Now notice with me, Verses 11 and 12 talk about um, uh, judgment falling upon the, the little horn and the beasts. But notice the language of 13 and 14. Um, if you'll read those verses for us. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Okay. The stone. Yeah, the stone that shatters all the other kingdoms. Um, very quickly here, just notice a little bit of the language. So there's one like the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. Okay, that should remind you of somebody. Who, 
uh, you know, Jesus, that was his favorite way to refer to himself, the Son of Man. Um, and he very clearly had uh, Daniel 7 in mind. One like the Son of Man who came, is coming on the clouds of heaven, but notice where he's coming. Often we think of this coming on the clouds as the coming of Jesus coming. to earth. And there, there's some, in Matthew, uh, I think 26, you know, Jesus uses some of that imagery of him coming on the clouds, returning to earth in judgment. But notice here in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is coming on the clouds. And where does he come to? He's brought near to the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days. Uh -huh. So. so think about Day of Atonement, somebody who is in a linen garment representing men, mm -hmm. and where does he approach? God's throne. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ancient of Days. Yes. He comes before the throne of God, that high priest, that, that's the only time he comes before God's presence so that God's people can be cleansed, yes. so their guilt can be expunged. And those who are enemies of God, those who are ruling and reigning as the wicked on the earth, so that their guilt can be, the consequences of their guilt can be upon them. Mm -hmm. There's a judgment in favor of the saints. Uh, Daniel 7.22 says judgment is made in favor of the saints. But we also see very clearly, such as in verses 11 and 12, it's made against mm -hmm. the wicked. Yes. So... Christ comes before the Ancient of Days. Here's this picture of Jesus as high priest coming before God's presence, and judgment is decided. Um, and the result of that judgment is that the wicked, the wicked kingdoms of this earth are destroyed, mm -hmm. and God's people are given the kingdom, and they are able to reign forever and ever. Notice verses 26 and 27. Uh, if you'll read those for us, but Renee. The court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So this is the good news of Daniel. Yes. That there is a judgment coming where those who are trusting in God, favor is going to be granted to them. Yes. Now think from Daniel's perspective. Have God's people been spotless? <laughs> no. I mean, that's why they're in this mess, right? The unfaithfulness of God's people has caused them to be brought into exile and wicked kingdoms to rule over them. But in the judgment... If they trust God, if they bring their sin before Him, if they are confessing and, and trusting in the sacrifice that God has provided, that unfaithfulness is wiped away. Yes. It's gone forever. And that's the, the real problem of the book of Daniel, right? Their sinfulness, their unfaithfulness. And then the second half, those who refuse to turn to God, those who are reigning in wickedness and sin, those who are setting up their own kingdoms apart from God's kingdom, they will not continue to reign. They will not continue to rule. Judgment will be made, and that sin will also be gone mm. and destroyed. One way or the other, sin is going to be destroyed. One way or the other, it's going to be gone. That's the good news of Daniel. It can be cleansed and removed through the, the, uh, the, the books being blotted out, or it can be destroyed when the kingdoms of this earth and those who cling to them are destroyed. The judgment is good news. And of course, that's what the name Daniel means, actually, right? God is my judge. He judges graciously. He judges righteously. Justice and mercy are the foundation of his throne. And so this cleansing of this sanctuary that Daniel saw is looking forward to that time when 
will enter that last stage of earth history, that final stretch that leads to the end. And in the end, sin is going to be cleansed. Sin is going to be gone one way or the other. We can put it in the sanctuary and let it be cleansed there, or we can cling to it and hold on to it, and we can, we can experience the consequences uh, as we clutch it in our, in our hands. Um, but the good news is it won't last forever. This cycle of sin is not going to repeat forever and ever and ever. There will be a full and final stop to it, and God's kingdom uh, and His righteousness will reign. Um, so, Daniel 8.14, And He said to me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Mm -hmm. So you have opened up what those words really mean. Yeah, and I think for Daniel, um, God is saying, it's not going to go on forever. Yes. I'm so it's not going to go on forever. Um, uh, righteousness, God's kingdom, goodness is going to reign. And uh, we will not be living in exile. We will not be exiled from God uh, forever. But we are going to be brought into His presence. Sin is going to be removed. Uh, wickedness is going to be destroyed. And we will be with God. We will tabernacle with Him in that Feast of Tabernacles. You can live through a very miserable night when you know that the morning mm -hmm. is coming. Amen. Amen. And that's the day that I think God is pointing to Daniel and to us to live for, right? Yes. The kingdoms now, this world, I mean, they're a mess. Uh, wickedness reigns. But God is saying, it, it won't reign forever. I will reign forever. And that's the hope that we looked forward to. And that God is not only going to forgive us, but He's going to forget our sins. He's going to wipe them clean. They will be blotted out forever. We just need to get them into His hands. We need to confess them and bring them before Him, and He will take care of them. Have the blood of Jesus come. Amen. Amen. So that's the good news of the book of Daniel. I'm so thankful for it and so thankful for um, how these threads come together in Scripture, all pointing toward Jesus and the hope that we ultimately have in Him. So um, I know we're a little bit over our time tonight. Let me just very quickly put up our reading for our next, uh, our next session. We're going to go on to Daniel chapter 10. Uh, we're also coming to the final stretch <laughs> here of Daniel. So um, if you will just simply read from the book of Daniel in time and context. Oh, I've got mine over there. Um, this is going to give you some of the context for um, Daniel chapter 10. And it will be very helpful in understanding why... Um, why Daniel is uh, fasting and praying in Daniel chapter 10 uh, and what is going on with God's people. So uh, I encourage you to uh, read this section here. Uh, we'll look at Daniel chapter 10 and um, uh, the, the larger picture that is there. After Daniel 10, we're going to hit the hardest chapter in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11. Um, pray for me as I prepare. Uh, we'll see, uh, see how, how uh, much of that we are able to cover, um, and then we'll enter into the final stretch in Daniel chapter 12. So uh, thank you so much for joining uh, us tonight. Uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close. The words, Heavenly Father, in Daniel 8, 13, are how long? And we have often wondered that same, Lord, how long will wickedness go on forever? Will sin reign? Um, will righteousness be ridiculed and oppressed? How long? And yet, Lord, we find here in Daniel this message of hope that no, it's not going to go on forever. And in fact, we are living in that time of the end. We are living in the last days of history when all is being wrapped up, when all will be made right, and you will reign forever. Oh, Lord God, we want our hearts, our sin, all of us to be brought into your presence. We want to experience your cleansing we want um, sin to be gone. 
never more to come between us and you. And thank you for the hope and promise uh, that you will do just that. Thank you for Jesus, our perfect sacrifice, our perfect high priest. And we look to him, we trust in him, and Lord, by his grace, may we live for him and for his kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you uh, next week. We will uh, dive into Daniel chapter 10. God bless you.